Hi, welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. I'm Sam Moores, and with us today we have Simon Saunders. Hello. Hello, how are you? Very good, very good. Can you tell the audience a little bit about sort of who you are and what you do? I'm director of Aerial Motor Company. We're a very small, low-volume car manufacturer. Um, we make, at the moment, we make two lightweight cars and a motorbike. Um, we've got plans to do other things, but we're a, we're kind of a minnow in the world of uh, automotive companies. <laughs> Um, and so how, how did this begin? Let's wind back a little bit, um, you know, your, your journey and all of this. Um, well, I'm, um, depending on how far back you want to go, I don't suppose you want to go back too far. I'm basically an automotive designer. Um, and yeah, I guess in all automotive designers, there's this kind of desire to make your own car, um, which has been there for a long time. Um, mm. Yeah, we've done quite a lot of projects over over the years, and <clears throat> I just felt um, that there needed to be a modern version, if you like, of the Lotus Seven. So you know, the Lotus Seven, which carries on as the Caterham, which is a, which is a great car, um, but it felt to me, probably going back twenty plus years, that there needed to be a modern equivalent of of the lightweight sports car at the time i was working at uh, coventry university as a senior lecturer in transport design uh, and i decided to do this project to do a lightweight sports car which was called the lsc for lightweight sports car unsurprisingly um, <laughs> and the car was first shown so the idea of it really was um a car that had lightweight and nimbleness yeah to get it to go fast rather than loads and loads of power. So it was a very, very minimal car. Um, we showed it at the 1996 motor show. Um, everybody raved about it, apart from the skinny tires. It had very, very skinny tires, 135 tires on at the time because we wanted to make everything as lightweight as possible. Um, so that was the main criticism about it, but everybody really liked the idea they liked the concept um so after the show we i started taking it further um and that eventually turned into what is now yeah. the aerial atom where did the sort of aerial motor car bit come in um aerial was i mean one of the interesting things about the British automotive industry is that at the time when I was working in Coventry, I think I found that there was something like 40 vehicle manufacturers around the turn of the last century. So we're talking 1900s. <clears throat> and mm. those have gradually been lost or faded away or been absorbed into other companies. And obviously British Leyland, British Motor Company, whatever, you know, whatever name it was at the time has been lost as well. And, I just wanted to do a bit of flag waving. An aerial seemed mm -hmm. to represent everything we wanted to do. I mean, it made motorcycles, it made cars, it made bicycles, it even made delivery vehicles as well. Um, and it was always at the forefront of innovation. So the old aerial, if, if you want a bit of history as well, actually started in 1871 with what mm. you or I would call a penny farthing bicycle but it's actually known as an ordinary. Um, and it was, the aerial ordinary was essentially the first production vehicle. So it was, it was when you look at it, to most people, it just looks like an antique, but it was a very revolutionary vehicle in its time. It had spoked wheels, which hadn't been seen before, and they were patented. It had a steel, lightweight steel frame, which again was a first for a production um, vehicle, yeah. bicycle. Um, so they they were there at the front, and like a lot of British industries, you know, they grew and grew um, over the years. They they ended up making all motorcycles, but also did the standard British automotive thing in the 1950s of not reinvesting. Yeah, they were then absorbed into BSA. By the time the investment was put in, it was sort of too little, too late. 
So it, here is almost a, a potted history of the British automotive industry. Um, and we, we felt it was worth resurrecting. Um, because yeah, yeah. we wanted to do cars, we wanted to do motorbikes and so forth. Um, and we wanted to do sort of pretty revolutionary vehicles as well. And, and what's the process? Like, do you find, how do you find the person that sort of owns the name, I guess? Is that, was that quite easy? Um, it's, it's, it's often quite difficult. I mean, if it's trademarked, you, you can look on the trade patent office. The patent office has register of all the trademarks. It's, it's really very, it's a very simple process. Um, mm. in the UK, it's incredibly difficult in the USA to try and do it online. Um, but it's a relatively easy process. The old, what was aerial motors, um, still exists as the, it's the aerial owners motorcycle club. Um, who we get on with really well. So there is that's the only fragment of the old company left. Um, but they're also very pleased that, you know, the aerial yeah. name's been revived and gone on to our vehicles and they're very good vehicles, I guess. So with so with the with the Atom, you wanted something super light, powerful, fun to drive. And this sort of this like the space frame concept which is i guess is sort of what it looks like um where did, did that was that just born out of okay we need an engine we need some wheels we need you know parts how can we package this in the lightest way or uh, had there was there was a certain amount of that but also there's there's an aesthetic which is you find in motorcycles which is motorcycles are, are the the sum of their parts if you like because they're not fully enclosed like a car you can see the frame, you can see the engine, you can see the handlebars, you can see visually how the, how the vehicle works. Yeah. Um, and also, a, a long time ago, probably as a teenager, I had a book on um, vehicle design, chassis design, and, and I had there were a couple of pictures in there, and the first picture was of a kind of rolling chassis with no bodywork on it, and over the page there was a picture of a car, the same car with the bodywork on it, yeah, and actually, with the bodywork on, it looked really disappointing. So, the, <laughs> the, the, the chassis without any bodywork was actually far more interesting um, than than when it yeah. was closed. So there was a certain amount of that, and and I think the fact it was also to do with you know the question was, do you need it? Can we lose it? Um, so we, yeah. we essentially to make the car as light as possible. Um, got rid of us, you know, the bodywork as well, because we just felt it wasn't essential. So, and the whole thing about lightweight is to do with power to weight ratio, which is, it's quite lengthy to explain. Mm. Um, but a, a Lamborghini with, I, I always find it quite hard to do the sums in my head, but let's say a Lamborghini with 600 brake horsepower that weighs 1500 kilos. Yeah has got a power to weight ratio of 400 brake horsepower per ton. Whereas an Atom, which has 300 brake horsepower, so half as much power, but only weighs 500 brake, uh, only weighs 500 yeah. kilos, has 600 brake horsepower per ton. So yeah. it, when it comes to, for instance, acceleration, we can easily out accelerate a Lamborghini, for instance, because of the power to weight ratio. And there are other there are other benefits of that. So you don't need enormous tires, which are very expensive. You don't wear out tires and brakes on track days. Um, so it's a cheaper car to run. It's a more fuel efficient car to run. Um, so there are lots and lots and lots of benefits of having lightweight, and even that goes mm. even into um, emissions and so on and so forth. So. It's not just in performance, but I mean, obviously, performance in a sports car is the, is the driving is the driving key, if you like. Yeah, and I I think that that figure sort of brake horsepower per ton doesn't get marketed that much from manufacturers because it seems over the last I don't know, well, quite a long time, manufacturers keep releasing you know oh we've got this amount of horsepower and it's always like a bigger horsepower figure, but they kind of ignore the fact that the weight has also gone up yeah. and therefore actually the performance of the car in terms of just 
speed could be the same or very similar. And then in all the other areas like braking, cornering, etc., it yeah. could be worse. And a light a lighter car will actually corner faster than a heavier car because of the you know um, the heavier car essentially wants to go straight on at the corner, whereas the you know without getting into all the engineering uh, details of it, I mean because you're you're trying to turn a, a lighter weight, it will turn much more easily. Um, so mm. there are there are enormous benefits to it, but it, you know it is it can be a bit of a numbers game with with the horsepower, but it it also puts enormous strain on the mechanical co- components. Um, so the, the the big what we call the big yeah. supercars, um, there's enormous strain going on through gearboxes and drive shafts. So uh, and you know they've, they've also got enormous tires as well to to put the power down. So there are lots of disadvantages with big, heavy cars that have a lot of a lot of power. So I came down to visit you guys and I went out in an, an Atom 4. And it was interesting because I've been in similar cars, I guess. So things like a, a Caterham and stuff like that in terms of the weight side of it. Um, and then also, I guess, my Radical is, is that sort of light. But... I've not been anything that felt felt so exposed where you're like, you can just stick your foot out if you wanted to <laughs> and, and kick the front wheel or, yeah. um, you know, all that. And I, it was, it was quite a difference, I would say, in terms of how out you feel. Um, and, pro- and probably makes things feel a lot faster <laughs> because of yeah, it. It's, it's, it's odd. I mean, it, I, I think one of the things for the Atom, we wanted people to be able to, firstly enjoy the driving experience so it's very much a driving car um but also mm. not necessarily be having to going at warp speed to be able to have yeah. to get some fun i mean one, one of the problems with some modern sports cars is actually you've, you've got to be going so fast on a public road to be having fun that it becomes dangerous if you like and if something goes wrong it goes wrong in a fairly spectacular yeah. fashion so the fact that you can see everything rushing by does give you a sense again it's it's sort of it's probably the closest thing to a motorcycle on four wheels you can get and you get that yeah. sense that you also get on a motorcycle of being sort of out i mean what I, I, one of an early i think a an early person who drove the Atom said, "You not you can not only see the countryside, you can smell it as well." So uh, it's 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 a, it's an interesting sensation, but it's 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 almost a total involvement and sort of total immersion in what you're doing. Mm. And the cars has the car changed quite a lot since um, the you know the first one to now, and there's a reasonable time period between the two. But what have been some of the major sort of developments and changes over time? Um, it has it has changed. I mean, I think if you look at an early one, if you saw one going down the road and look at an early one and look at a modern one, there are lots of similarities, but it has evolved mm. a lot over the years to the point where the previous car. And the which was the Atom 3.5 and the Atom 4 only share, I think it's three common components, which is the fuel cap, the clutch, and the brake pedal. So, to, <laughs> to, to the casual onlooker, they, they look very similar. Um, but we've made an awful lot of changes to the cars over the years. I mean, the car mm. actually started off with a Rover engine, um, and in 2000 and to 2003 we changed to a honda engine um and that was a big and significant change for us um and we've used honda engines ever since uh in the atom they're they're the type r engines in the nomad it's a 2.3 four cylinder uh iv tech engine as well so that was significant um on the atom four we did a lot of work on suspension, so it has anti-dive, anti-squat. Now has traction control. We never used to have any driver aids. We right, now have yeah. traction control and launch control um, because they be, become more of a necessity. Drivers have asked for them. Um, 
we've done a lot of work on an amazing amount of work on aerodynamics uh, to improve the aerodynamics of the car and also um, control the airflow, not not just improve downforce and so forth, but to actually control the airflow as the car when... has got an intercooler. So we did a lot of work on getting air into the intercooler and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I guess if someone just looks looks at an atom, you might not think that there's a lot of sort of air being sculpted, etc. because of the, the amount of sort of aerospace. But I guess a key bit for you is getting, like I said, air into the right place um, so that, you know, the engine can stay cool and, and all of that. With the, um, when, it, when you switched to, actually, because the, the engines have sort of have come from Honda and have typically been in, like I said, at Type R, which I don't know what they weigh, let's say 1,400 kilos or something. That's just an absolute guess. Did As soon as you put that engine in a car that weighs 600 kilos, you know, 550 to 600 kilos, does the engine react quite differently? Does it almost feel like a different engine just with a straight transplant? I know you've done a bit Um, of work on them. I don't think it doesn't necessarily feel like a, different engine but i mean the fact that the car is half the weight does obviously give a different response from the engine i mean the we we don't change things we well i, I take that back actually i was going to say we don't change things like flywheels but we do we can change things like flywheels so um we on the previous cars since 2005 we used to supercharge the engines um we, we so the engines themselves we do tune but the basic engine is still the same Honda basic engine and it's I mean one reason for choosing it is that it's had thousands of miles of testing thousands of hours of development so we the, the reliability of the car is is second to none and it will do some of our customers, their their day out will be to drive to a racetrack, do a track day for the whole day, and drive home again. Um, and they won't want to lift a spanner to the car or start repairing it or uh, do anything like that. They just want to get in the car and drive it. So the the Honda engine has contributed greatly to to that level of reliability. I guess it's it's less stressed. You, you might, I don't know whether you rev it out a little bit more or anything like that. And obviously you have turbocharged, it's turbocharged or was supercharged, but just lugging around that weight or lack of weight, it's not working as hard. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's less, there's less stress on all the drive line and the gearbox um, and, the, and the engine. So as you say, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's pushing around uh, probably, between you're probably not far off on the weights i mean a, a, a type r will be 13 1400 kilos and we're between five and six hundred kilos now so mm. um it's it's sort of less than half the weight but it that that's one other thing that that gives us such good reliability because nothing's under the same sort of strain it is and we we yeah. do we do manufacture parts for reliability rather than uh, I, I suppose the best way to explain it is it's not a race car so a, a race yeah. car is made to basically do a race and obviously win the race and then be serviced partially stripped maybe engines are made so that yeah. they're, they're rebuilt every x number of hours uh, we we don't do that i mean an atom is not a race car it is it is every single car we make is road registered um, but it does have to have a track capability, which again, a lot of the big supercars, they will do it. But I mean, partly because they're so expensive, you don't really want to take one on a track day. Um, but also, yeah. they they don't really like it. They're not designed to spend all day on the track um, because they it puts an awful lot of stress on the components. And they will, for instance, it will it will wear out tires and it will wear out brakes. So. It, it can a big heavy car be it a ferrari lamborghini whatever something like that 
is an expensive day out on the track. The track day is quite cheap, but the tyres and brakes are a few thousand pounds. So it, yeah. it turns into quite an expensive day out. Whereas, uh, you know, the Atom tyres, you won't wear them out in the same way you will a, a big supercar. And also the tyres are probably a quarter of the price. So um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very seldom do you need to change brake pads because, again, you're not having to, to sort of stop that amount of mass um, for a corner. So lightweight has an awful lot going for it. So yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one, that one that I think a lot of people definitely on there, if they've bought a modern sort of sports car, supercar type thing, and they go to a track day, if you, if you've been in the sort of race car world or done some racing, you're very used to sort of cost per kilometer. You're aware yeah. that just driving the car, you have, you know, things that will need to be changed after a certain amount of time. But I, I definitely had it when I took my first sort of sports car to a track day. I sort of assumed that the track day price was the cost of the day. And then you realize that, you, you know, you've got fuel and then your tires. And then you're like, oh, okay, I've done a set of tires. You don't, a lot of people don't think, okay, how quickly will this stuff wear out? I need to factor in this costs into my day. So rather than yeah. whatever it is, 400 pounds for the track day, actually you need to set aside a thousand pounds. And by the end of your fifth track day, you will need to have spent five grand on the car or, you know, or yeah. whatever it is, two and a half grand or something. Um, and it's that if, if you're listening and you've never been to a track day, have that in the back of your mind that you need to set aside a little bit more money than you think for things like brake pads and tires and whatever because you will you will get through them and it's it, the big bill will come at some point in time yeah and and the stickier the tires the more quickly they'll wear out as well so you know it's uh, it, yeah. it can be you know for for a big heavy powerful car it can be quite an expensive day out and and then you mm. know there's the whole cost of the car as well you know that it's quite intimidating i mean i think one of the other problems is if you turn up with something uh, a kind of real really nice supercar everybody's going to be watching you as well so um, yeah yeah, there's, yeah, that, yeah. there's that pressure you're gonna to have to be a great driver as well otherwise um you can have egg on your face but it's it's um that it is i mean lightweight is is the key for us anyway in that in in that situation yeah so and over the sort of years and and developing the car up to this point, I, I guess some of the decisions were t are sort of taken out of your hands in terms of the powertrain. You can you can make some adjustments, but you're pretty much going for that. Let's say that sort of Honda engine, which is now turbocharged and for emissions and and whatever and on all the sort of things. But I guess bring some some different benefits. Have you? What's your sort of each time you do a sort of revision? What are you pushing towards? Is it, you know, performance? Because I imagine you could make the cars faster if you wanted to, but you might lose a lot of, like, let's just say straight line performance. You could possibly, I don't know, how could you put wider tyres? There's always a bit of a grey area around whether wider tyres actually lead to more grip. Um, but what's your sort of ethos when you make decide what to change moving forward and, and like pushing the envelope and stuff I, th I i think it has to be a whole package with with there's a certain amount mm. of pressure for any manufacturer sports car manufacturer to improve performance um yeah because you're always measured against your last best performance or you're measured against others so there's there's yeah. a constant um desire I guess just human nature to try and improve on mm. what you've done before. Um, we don't want that to be um, at the cost of, for instance, losing reliability. So when we tune an engine, we don't tune it to as far as it will go. We'll we'll see as far as it will go, and then we'll back off um, because yeah. we need to preserve reliability. There, there's an expectation in any modern vehicle. Um, including ours, that you can get in and drive it and it will be reliable. I, I don't think mm. people, unless you get into the race car world, most of our customers are not 
that interested in fiddling around with cars and and mending yeah. them and so on and so forth. And I, and I think people just don't have the time anymore to do that. I mean, maybe, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was a necessity just to keep your car going. Um, but yeah. people no longer have either the interest or the time to do it. But also, I mean, we don't, it's not just performance we're looking at. We're looking at driver comfort, which may not, which may come as a surprise with the <laughs> car because it looks fairly basic inside. But with, with you know, there is the ergonomics of supporting the driver, making sure they're comfortable, pedal position and so on and so forth are very important, as you'll know, um, from, from driving your race car. Yeah. Um, it's, it's important on the track. It's important on the road. Driver comfort in terms of aerodynamics. We have we have these very small pieces of clear plastic in front of the driver. Um, we do do a full windshield for the car, but on the standard car, yeah. we have these kind of tiny pieces of plastic, which which kind of look as though they're a bit of a, 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 a sort of comical joke, really. But they we've spent so long developing these. Um, <laughs> they not only provide a surprising amount of downforce, but they give the driver so much more comfort, um, taking yeah. pressure off their head um, because your your head is exposed in would be in an airstream were it not for these little bits of plastic. So the whole essence of, I mean, what one of the, one of the dangers of um, any modern car, I guess, is that as, as they get better, for want of another word, they usually get heavier. And whether it's whether yeah. it's a Range Rover or an Aerial Atom, as they improve, they just generally get heavier. So one of our constant battles in improving the car is is trying to keep it as light as we possibly can, but but treading yeah. that line between safety and 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 comfort and performance and longevity um is is what we're we're up against and and there is new technology that comes along as well so we, we're always trying to build things new things into the car so we do try and it's not just a question of going faster and faster as i say it's it's not a race car um if it was a race car only used on the track you'd probably be able to push the limits a bit more because you're in an environment where everybody is going the same way in theory on a racetrack. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've got yeah. runoff areas and if something breaks, you, you, you break down and you mend it for the next race. But because our cars are road cars, they, they have to have crash worthiness. They have to meet all the legislation, the legal requirements for, for lighting, for emissions, and so on and so forth. So, it's when we we do a new car, all these things have to be in our mind as we develop it. Yeah, it's an interesting point about leaving performance on the table because I, I just sort of thought about and was thinking about that and thinking there's so many uh, because a lot of modern cars are turbocharged and whether it's a you know Mercedes or a, your Porsche 911 or something a classic example would probably be a, a now like a C63 or something lots of consumers now get the car and then immediately go oh yeah but if I chip it I can get another 100 horsepower or whatever out of it and they go and chip it and then they they don't think about that thing of well actually there's a reason the manufacturer the probably the manufacturer's left if it's a, a, a reasonable amount on the table for because of all of the things you've just said but you are then taking that car considerably closer to its limit depending on who's done the chipping you might have taken it yeah, exactly. to a point where it's going to and then they everyone's like oh yeah and it, it, it exploded or i blew a drive shaft yeah. or something and you're like oh what oh whoops um whereas yeah like you said a race cars are, are more on the limit and you're right. I mean, and in a race car, you might be prepared to take that risk because mm. if, if you push it to the limit, you, you understand the risks of that. You, you hope it'll last the, let's say, 20 minute, 30 minute, one hour race or whatever it is. And, and you take that gamble, um, which yeah. a lot of the time will pay off. Some of the time it won't. 
and and that happens all the way up to Formula One. Um, so, which is acceptable to many people in in a race environment because it gives you that opportunity to do better or win the race. Um, whereas on a production car, there just has to be that margin of safety that the manufacturers yeah. build in. I mean, and luckily for us with Honda, there's there's such a margin of safety built in that we've got a degree of flexibility that we we can yeah. push that margin um, a bit further. But it's it's the same as I mean, without getting too technical, you know, you'll understand from from your racing days is is pushing the fueling of a car, which will give yeah. you more um, performance. But the car will run hotter. Everything will be nearer its limits, um, and and you you will start affecting the limits of reliability as well. So we just don't don't want to play that game for the sake of another ten brake horsepower or fifteen brake horsepower. Yeah. It's and it's also as you go up in power, it's a law of diminishing returns. You know, if you go from 50 brake horsepower to 100 brake horsepower, um, it's a massive increase. If you go from 500 brake horsepower to 550 brake horsepower, it's actually not such a big increase relative to the performance you'll get. Yeah. So it is a law of diminishing and the cost returns goes up. As, you, as you get more car. And the cost goes up. Yes, that's exactly right. No, yeah, it's like all those things are sort of in, in the mix. And I guess you have to be very focused and... I guess this is probably the benefit of being a small manufacturer is you don't want to end up in the situation, which I would say, let's say uh, a car like the mini, let's talk about the revised mini rather than the original mini, but like the new ish, I don't know when it came out, 2004 or whatever. Um, you could, you look at minis on the road now and they are no longer mini at all in the slightest. And mm. what they've done is they've listened to customer feedback who've gone, well, actually, I'd quite like a little bit more space and I'd quite like, you know, a bit more tech and a bit more stuff. And you end up with this product that is actually completely different to the initial sort of design brief. And actually, to most people, when you're looking at it, it's then a different product and you compare it against different cars and you're not buying it. People aren't buying it because it's small anymore and you've lost that yeah. the ethos. And I imagine you could very easily go, right, we want it to be faster and have more tech and maybe, you know, more safety stuff and, and, and push all of the things and end up with a thousand kilo car, like probably pretty easily. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, it, it, it is, it's very easy to put, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's a circular argument as well. It's, if you, you put more, you put more power in, you need bigger tires, you know, bigger yeah. tires need bigger wheels. You then need bigger drive shafts. Um, the car gets heavier, so you need more power. And, and yeah. you're just in this circle where there's more power, There's everything else goes up at the same time. Um, and and you, you, you have a heavier car, you'll also have a more expensive car. Um, and I, I, I think the other thing that we, we've done with the Atom and we, we try to retain is that it's not a racing car. Racing cars... Um, made to be driven by racing drivers um, yeah. and they require a certain amount of skill uh, and experience whereas we want anybody to be able to climb in our car and have some fun so not, not every car we sell is sold because people want to go as fast as possible some of them yeah. just want to have a car they can drive and have some fun in so and it's even the same on the circuits. Some some people want to go around circuits going sideways, for instance, you know, because mm. it's good fun. It's not the fastest way around yeah. the circuit, as you all appreciate. But they're having fun and, and you know, we have a little motto at work which is which is our sort of strap line, if that's what I can refer it to it as, is serious fun. Um, because it is a very serious car. I mean it goes seriously fast. But at the end of the day, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to put a smile yeah. on your face. And that's kind of the most important thing for us, whether you're doing <clears throat> whether you're doing a track day, whether you're just driving on the road, if you're driving down through France, whatever, the, the car will do it. 
and we just want you to be smiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the cars that you um, you did you, or you've done in the past that made me smile when it came out, and I don't know what it was like. I never experienced driving one, but when the V8, when you did the V8, that seemed particularly bonkers <laughs> at the time. What was, what was the sort of thinking behind that car? Um, it was it was fairly bonkers. I mean, I, I think it was a desire just to push the car as far as we could at the time. So yeah. the V8, it came in two versions, 475 brake horsepower or 500 brake horsepower. So you're, you're up around 900, 950, <laughs> approaching 1,000 brake horsepower per tonne. It was it was an interesting car. We learned we learned a lot from it. I mean, it was for us. It was probably verging more towards a race car than the normal Atom. Mm. We only made twenty five of them. Um, for us, it was interesting because we we learned an awful lot about the car, um, and it was some of the things on the car. So it had, for instance, it had a sequential change paddle operated gear change uh, right, as, yeah. as on a race car or a Formula One car. That that's worked its way into the standard atom. So it it wasn't exactly an R and D project, but it it certainly we gained a lot of insight into how we could things we should do and also things we shouldn't do with with the atom as well. Um, as I yeah. say, it's probably verging a bit too much onto race car territory for for a lot of our customers. Um, but it was it was an incredible car. I mean, it's it's still we we sort of it's it was quite interesting even at at, at work when when the V eight went went out down the road, people would actually stop and listen, you know, because it just yeah, yeah, yeah. it going down the road. So so the workshop would go quiet as it sailed off into the distance. But um, it was it was an interesting car. We won't. I don't think we'll ever be making another one because I think V eights are fast becoming a thing of the past. But um, yeah. It was it was interesting. It was really interesting car, and it and held it, the you know it held the top gear lap record for two and a half years. Um, and the Pagani that eventually beat it was was on cut slicks. So yeah, um, cheating for, for, a, for a small, very small British company in Somerset. That that was quite an achievement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a super cool thing, and I, I think I remember sort of hearing about. Uh, sort of roughly how it drove because it was had a, a bit more weight at the back um, and then possibly a bit lighter at the front. Did that lead to more kind of aero, working on the aero stuff a little bit more and then also, I guess, the cars after that didn't have so much weight in the back anyway? Yeah, it wasn't so much. I mean, I think we, we the, 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 the early test cars um, <clears throat> suffered from we we didn't have the diff set up so the without right. getting too technical about it the rear was trying to push on um, yeah i get that when we it's adjusted we, we adjusted the limited slip differential quite a lot um and that changed it but we've done a lot of we've done a lot of aero work on the car on the atom four since then which is a lot of it is not just about increasing downforce it's about balancing the car as well because the car yeah. is, it's rear heavy um, because mm. the engine's, you know, behind the driver. Um, so there's not an awful lot of weight on the front. I think it's about a 60-40 split, which race drivers love. Um, but we, a lot of the aero work we continue to do is about getting, getting a balance in the car mm. and also adjustability. Because I, I think the other thing, we found very early on with the Atom, we, we did some racing with the Atom. We had lots and lots of different people in it. And the interesting thing was how different people drove, their different driving styles and the different setup. Okay, so we yeah. do a setup for we do a setup for one driver who would win his race. And then the, this I think it was a brick car race. The following weekend we'd have a different driver in the car, all experienced drivers who would go out in the car and we'd have to adjust everything and interestingly that driver would win his race but the difference in setup was was really pronounced um, interesting because some people wanted a uh, had a very very smooth driving style um, other people actually 
other drivers wanted the car quite um, nervous, if you like. Yeah. So they would they would be adjusting it constantly as they went through a corner. So mm. the Atom has that ability to be able to adjust it um, if you want to to a particular driving style. Um, although the, the standard car we set up to be as sort of user friendly as possible, but it does have yeah. the adaptability for people who want to do that. Yeah, and then I guess with you can have. You, you do some different sort of suspension options, but also I think even the, the standard car is, is on adjustable suspension, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the thing about the options is there is a standard car which will do anything you want it to do. I mean, you could get in it and drive to the south of France. You can go and do a track day. Yeah. Um, there are lots of, it's a very long option list. And our first question to a customer is, what do you want to do with the car? Because we mm. have, you know, at extremes, we have people who never go on the track. And at the other extreme, yeah. we have customers who only go on the track. A lot of them, many customers are somewhere in between, so they want to drive the car on the road and do track days. But that starts to allow us to spec the car for what you want to do. So we do have, I think yeah. we've got on the Atom, we've got three, possibly four different kinds of suspension We've got three different kind of brakes. We've, we, we, we're constantly investigating new options as well. But we're also the first to say, um, you know, if somebody wants a fun road car, we'll, we'll probably talk them out of certain options. I mean, we are the world's worst car salesman. Um, <laughs> because rather than talking you into things, we're often talking you out of them. Because we just yeah, yeah. actually want the car to be right for what you want to do. And putting... Yeah. For instance, a multi-adjustable damper, which are quite complex things, onto something that is purely a fun road car is really slightly unnecessary. So we might well talk you out of it and probably save you two or three thousand pounds into the bargain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just remembering it. I think it was a quote when I was going around Lotus, and it was like, "If you let them adjust it, they'll adjust it wrong." <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think if you put if you put the wrong level of adjustment in it, without, I mean, we also do you know we we we're all we're like, we're always there for our owners. We wouldn't. I think if you do the design right, you won't. People won't be able to get themselves into that problem, yeah. if you like, of, of adjusting things wrongly. But we're always there to 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 advise anyway. I mean, I think yeah, the yeah, other yeah. thing is about the options is that. <clears throat> There are no two cars that are the same. So every single car we built, build, is is built to order um, for a specific order. So we never make a car on spec and try and sell it. Every single car is made for an individual, and it's made to their specification. So it's really important for us to be able to get the car right for that particular owner and what they yeah. want from it. And you, you can always come back. I mean, we have a lot of owners that come back and um, add options at a later date because maybe they, you know, they're doing more track days, for instance. So they want yeah. to upgrade the brakes. Um, so it's one of the flexibilities you have as a small company that you don't as a big company. And, and I think mm. what we try and do as a small company is is let let the small the small size play to our advantage rather than being a disadvantage because there are lots of things we can't do um, yeah. as a small company, but there are things we can do. And, and one of the important things for us is to have that closeness, if you like, with our owners. So it's, it's, we, it sounds a bit twee, but we just actually want it to be a happy family, really. And yeah. I mean, the, the nice thing for customers is they can come down and see their cars and build yeah, the, the car is actually built by one technician, so we don't, as you saw when you came down, we don't have a production line like a big company. Yeah, the the chassis comes in, goes into one build space, and that technician builds the car from start to finish. And yeah. customers are welcome to come down, see the car and build, talk to the guy building it, which again is something you can't do in a big car factory. Um, yeah. I don't think they'll even let you in because of health and safety problems. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, there are lots of small advantages that we sort of we can do as a, as a small 
company that you you can't as a big one so yeah yeah yeah. it seems like benefits and it's nice i imagine a lot of um customers if they if if they buy a second hand car down the line i imagine you probably see quite a few come back and because they're all sort of bespoke for each customer then the new customer might go okay i want it slightly differently and the cars come back and you could change a few things yeah yeah we can do that i mean some owners we've got some owners who've kept the same car and we've upgraded it um we have some owners who've sort of changed from one atom to another atom as we've introduced another one i mean one Mm. one thing about the cars is their residuals are are remarkable i mean they they hold their value incredibly well yeah and we've quite often said to to customers who've bought back their car for for upgrades to to the latest spec actually you it would be better for you to have a new car and sell the old car because it's yeah. financially it's going to be cheaper to do that than upgrade the old one. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The money's you know your money's kind of safe in the car if you like. So yeah, they, yeah and that is a a good thing. And, and I've noticed that over the time about atoms, like they hold, they do hold their value. Which as a when you're considering putting a, a reasonable amount of money into a car, actually, if you're not looking at horrific depreciation, that makes a huge difference to your your ownership cost of that vehicle and i guess there's likelihood that you'll pull the trigger and and get one because you know worst comes to worst you can sell it and get most of that back yeah exactly i mean it is probably on it on any car it's probably one of the biggest costs if not the biggest cost is depreciation and and and, and i guess particularly for what what is a fun car like an atom uh, if 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 you can if you can have one have your fun and then sell it without a big loss it it's it just adds to the fun i guess yeah and a lot of our owners are not you know they're not multi-millionaires you know and, and and some of our owners have said the only reason i can i can have this car is because i know i can sell it again for more or less what i paid for it yeah. so it's it's a way of having their fun without without losing sort of a shed load of money if you like yeah, 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 totally. Right, I'm aware we're we're slightly or we're, we're a bit tight for time, so I not I try and get these the five questions in. I, I quite like to get those in. So um, let's 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 crack on. Do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey? We were in absolutely torrential rain. I mean, like monsoon weather in an atom, mm. which <laughs> obviously has no roof, um, no doors, no windscreen on this particular car. I mean, I, I had an oversuit on, which is, yeah. you know, essentially we say you waterproof yourself, don't try and waterproof the car. The car's fine because everything's waterproof on it, like, like a motorcycle. Um, but there was, it was, it was so wet at one point. We actually have drain holes in the floor of, yeah. of, the, of the car. Uh, so it, if it's that wet, it doesn't fill up with water. But it got to the point where the, 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 some of the puddles were so large that there was water coming up through the floor. Um, it was, and it was, that was quite an interesting drive, but it actually got to the point when, you know, it can't get any wetter and yeah. it was just <laughs> hilarious basically. And everyone, <laughs> there were sort of four or five atoms and everybody just remembers it. At the time, everybody was kind of, some people were absolutely soaked. But yeah. looking back on it, it was probably one of the most memorable drives in an atom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always, it's always those ones that are like challenging that you you recall the most. <laughs> um, if you could only drive one car for the rest of your life, actually, okay, you get two cars, one unlimited value, any car, and then you've got like a thousand pounds for something else. So you can have something that's like super cheap and practical on the side, and then you've got one car. What's the one car? Oh, that's a difficult one. So I, I presume I've got to discount anything we make. Probably because that may not fit into your. <laughs> let's, let's, yeah, let's do something. Discount the stuff you make. It's probably going to be a an old Land Rover Defender. Okay. Surprisingly, it's a it's a bit of a love hate relationship. But yeah. as a family, we've 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 had a lot of Defenders, and they're 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 the only vehicle that actually gets better as they get older. You know, the rough <laughs> the rougher they the more dense they have, the the, the more um the more life they seem yeah, yeah. they seem to get so 
I think that'll be the and and the interesting thing is they say very little about you. So you know yeah. you can be you can be a hill farmer or the queen. Basically, it's uh, yeah. it's an interest. It's a very interesting vehicle. Um, the thousand pound one. Gosh, I don't know what you can buy for a thousand pounds these days. It's, um, it's true, and a, and a lot less now than think, two years ago when I first. Well, not when well, I, I started. Say you but might, when I started, you might it's changed to, a lot. <laughs> you might need to go up your thousand pounds with inflation. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I, I don't know really. I mean, I'm oh, I'm searching around for something. It's so. I'm, I'm sort of old enough that the cars I bought for under a thousand pounds um, <laughs> are now worth a fortune when I was yeah, young, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, probably wouldn't, wouldn't have that conversation. I, no I think it would be incredibly difficult. I think yeah, I'm going to pass on the thousand okay. pound one. What's the most undervalued car at the moment? What should be worth more? I think looking at there's a, there's um, and I, if you're talking about old cars, I've, I've always slightly lusted after accord um not an accord a cord c-o-r-d um and cord 810 or cord 812 810 or 812 and they seem as as classic car prices have risen and risen and risen and risen yeah the cords seem incredibly undervalued i mean they were they were remarkable car for their time i mean they came out just at the wrong time at the, yeah. at the beginning and middle of the depression um but they were they were a remarkable car front wheel drive um pop-up headlamps um pre-selector gears there you go um and they're they're a really dramatic car um yeah and they're, they're, the, the convertibles for some reason are astronomical money but the mm. um and I don't think they're as nice, but the, the, the saloons, yeah, so that's a, that's the fight, and I think it's called. They're probably $150,000 plus. Google one of these. It's, it's a sort of, I would say, kind of swoopy aero design from, you know, yeah. way back. But it's, it's a, you know, it's quite a remarkable car. And, I, I, you know, they, they sit in the States, they seem to go for forty, fifty, sixty thousand yeah. dollars $60,000. And it's, they just look to me as though they're undervalued but uh, yeah, yeah yeah cool that's a good one um what is the most interesting car to you at the moment what are you sort of looking up googling that sort of thing um because we're doing a lot of work on zero emissions evs yeah um, we're we're really interested in all the evs that are, that are coming out no particular i mean it's it's interesting to look at the the, the raft of electric vehicles that are coming out it's also interesting to see the the problems that even the big manufacturers uh, are having with yeah. the technology because the technology is moving so fast at the moment it's really difficult to keep up which is a bit like how it was in sort of 1900 if you like because again mm. the te technology was moving really fast then so i don't think there's a particular car we 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 look up to at the moment it's just it's just looking at, at, at all the new particularly high power evs that are coming out yeah i think we we'll, we might have to do another podcast at another time on um on the sort of evs in the in the future of yeah. uh, of, of aerial and moving forward and sustainability and all that sort of stuff um but five car garage unlimited value a 1963 corvette Nice. Split window. Yeah. Uh, the cord. Uh, yeah. Cord supercharged 812. That's two. An old shape V8 Defender. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, what are we up to? Three there. Yeah. Uh, as, as, as you're paying, um, <laughs> yeah. I'll have a Ferrari, Ferrari 275 GTV long nose. Yeah, 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 definitely. Very nice. Good GT Cruiser, classy. And then you've got one more? One more. Hmm. I mean, I'm discounting again. I'm discounting our, our vehicles yeah. because I can, go, I can go and use an aerial atom any time. Yeah. I, I think it, it, it would have to be uh, a decent pickup truck. 
but okay. I can't yeah. put a name to it. Yeah. Actually, a useful, I think that's, a useful pickup truck. Yeah, for doing all the stuff. Um, well, I think that's a, a good question, actually. If you were to have one of your cars, yeah. an, an aerial, which would you go for? You only got one. Um, we've only got one. I, I guess it's going to have to be it's going to have to be an atom um, rather than the I don't know it could be a nomad oh that's a tricky one uh, <laughs> I think I'd have to have one of each um, I think it might be a nomad at the moment but okay. I might change my mind tomorrow and have an atom yeah. so uh, or possibly a motorbike actually no I'm going to have an ace okay yeah 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 for the ultimate in open and the, air that experience. that'll be actually that'll be the fifth the fifth one in the in the in the garage will will be um a Harley Davidson. Nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally different experience. Cruise yeah. around. Cool. Well, I think that's a good selection. I know we've we've been uh, on a slightly tighter schedule today, so we haven't managed to dive off too much into into different topics and whatnot. But um thank you very much. For, for coming on the podcast it was good to chat it was good to see you the other day yeah i mean we can maybe if you we'll have something interesting to shout about after september or in yeah, september we'll do another one then so i mean we we'll do maybe do another one then and look at the new stuff we do, we're working yeah. on as well yeah i think i think there's lots to explore in those in yeah in that larger topic um but yeah okay well yeah, yeah we'll sort that out and um, thanks very much for coming on.